Hey guys. Uh, I'm going to welcome up my panelists. I cover tech over at CNBC with a focus on crypto, and I'd love to just go down the line and have my panelists introduce themselves. So kick us off. Hi, I'm uh, Francesco. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Superfluid. We're a DeFi protocol that allows people to stream money, so send money every second without making recurrent payments. We're trying to enable use cases like subscriptions, salaries, and uh, other streams of value that happen on chain. Uh, I think I'm one of the most web free on the panel, but go on. I'm uh, Guillaume Ponsin. I run the crypto team at Stripe. Uh, we operate at the intersection of fiat and crypto, like fiat payment for crypto exchanges, um, processing payments, payouts, uh, financial infrastructure for the internet using crypto, and then over time, we will also build Web3 developer tooling. Great. Uh, my name is Larry Wade. Um, I head up risk and compliance for PayPal's blockchain, crypto, and digital currencies group. Hey, my name is Miles Suter. I lead the crypto team at Cash App. Cash App's mission is to make money more relatable, instantly available, and universally accessible. And my team's mission is to do that on, uh, with Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin focus right now. Great. So the old trope is, when am I going to be able to pay for a cup of coffee with crypto? And the <laughs> problem with that is the fact that it's a pretty seamless experience today from the user side of that equation. Now, in terms of the merchant's perspective, it could be a negative value transaction. Like, you have to pay these fees for the privilege of using a credit card network. And I've got uh, panelists from businesses, like from companies in the business of crypto and payments. And where I want to start is, is crypto the ultimate fix to the merchant side of this equation? Miles, kick us off. You know, I think there are some advantages for merchants, especially the lack of chargebacks. I think with the Lightning Network, we now have a free, essentially free, and instant global network accessible to everyone uh, using what I believe is going to be the global reserve currency of the future. And so that, that does increase access to everyone. I think as a merchant, you really do want to have ubiquitous acceptance and not turn away any customers. And when there's a truly global currency, one that can be sent um, with very low fees, instant finality, I think that has a ton of advantages for merchants. I think that custom, uh, customers are used to certain benefits of the legacy card networks, like refunds, chargeback, protection. Um, there, there's a number of merchant and payment processing tools that still need to be built on top of these new decentralized networks, but I think they'll come. And I think the uh, entrepreneurs around the world will see the problems, uh, where they can complement these new global systems that are, are outside the existing banking system, and we'll see those emerge and really close the loop on these new payment systems. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the digital asset space um, will be this world of kind of like interoperability. So being able to utilize existing uh, payment mechanisms um, as well as crypto and you know, instruments such as stable coins, CBDCs, et cetera, and being able to kind of interoperate and go in and out seamlessly, um, I think that's where we'll kind of see things go. Um, and I think that will definitely lower the friction that we're seeing right now because you won't necessarily have to have Bitcoin or Ethereum, you'll be able to kind of have your one wallet, and then we can utilize that to, to make transactions, et cetera. Uh, Guillaume, I'm about to go to you uh, with a question. I want to zero in on Bitcoin for a moment. 13 years ago, the white paper was all about a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, eliminating the need for credit card companies or banks as intermediaries. It's strayed from that thesis. Bitcoin as an asset has supplanted this idea of Bitcoin as a currency. And I think that Stripe has an especially interesting relationship with Bitcoin. You were, the company was early to uh, let users transact in Bitcoin. And then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was my understanding that transaction volume wasn't high enough. So then that feature was retracted. And now you're back with crypto payments. Walk us through your thinking and, and how, how uh, crypto payments have evolved over at Stripe. Yeah, no, this is a very interesting question. I think Stripe was very early in accepting Bitcoin payment, maybe a little bit too early, uh, 2015. Um, at that point, the Lightning Network didn't even exist. It was just a, an idea on paper or not even published yet. Um, and so we've seen tremendous progress since then. But at that point, I think the demand wasn't quite there. Things weren't working quite well. And the, the fact that Bitcoin, like crypto goes up, crypto goes down, Bitcoin was at the same time a speculative asset, at the same time trying to use it for payments is actually a very difficult proposition for, for both 
merchants and buyers. Everybody is sad when, when your currency goes up and goes down uh, as you do the transactions, as you process a refund. Uh, so we've learned a lot from that experience. Uh, and I think now we, have, we see the advent of stable coins, we see um, new tooling, we see Lightning Network, we see things that will make it much more feasible. Uh, and so that's why we are exciting to come back into the space and, and um, give it another go. And there's definitely more to dig in on with respect to, you just brought up stable coins and the Lightning Network. We're going to circle back to both of those things. <laughs> uh, Larry, one more question for you. I, you know, in June, you, in 2020, like PayPal leaned in in a more appreciable way into the crypto space. In June of this year, like crypto existing as a, like within a walled garden of PayPal changed. So talk us through your evolution of, of how you've integrated crypto payments into the platform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, at PayPal, we're really excited about just the digital asset space. Um, obviously, we do payments. And what we wanted to do initially was to create a product that obviously was compliant, um, that was uh, approached in a very risk-based manner, seamless, easy, what PayPal is known for, and then kind of get our feet wet there and learn. In June, we introduced transfers where we opened up the PayPal wallet for the first time, where you could receive uh, and send digital assets you know, that we support, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and Ethereum. So it was extremely important um, and exciting. I would say that uh, another thing is just the fact that once you introduce digital assets um, you know, into a wallet such as PayPal, it allows for this world of, of instant settlement or near instant settlement in a more compliant manner, which a lot of people don't realize that. There's blockchain monitoring tools, et cetera, um, ways to really enhance your, your financial crimes program and things of that nature. So being able to have faster, cheaper, near instant settlement in a more compliant manner, we're, we're excited. Um, Francesco, Superfluid is our crypto native team on this panel. Uh, you're more than a payments platform. You stream money. You're doing interesting work with subscriptions. And so I want to ask you, you know, as a, as a crypto native platform, what are the things that you can do that these guys can't <laughs> at their companies? Yeah, well, I mean, what we do at Superfluid is uh, effectively allow these uh, money flows that happen on chain, right? Using Superfluid, you make one transaction, and then money starts streaming to the counterparty. This is a, a new way of using money that doesn't really exist in the real world. Uh, so, I mean, what we do can't be done in fiat. It's just not possible. Nobody's ever done that. And uh, I think one day they will, probably. But at the moment, they don't. Um, basically, for example, imagine I'm receiving part of my salary in a super fluid stream. As I receive that every second, I'm reinvesting that in a dollar cost averaging market to buy Ethereum. Right, so my total exposure to dollars is zero at any given point in time, because as I get paid every second, that payment is settled and immediately reinvested. This is something that, you know, it's very hard to do on chain. We managed to do it on chain, but it's absolutely impossible to do off chain. So, you know, we, we believe that uh, on chain payments are gonna take over. We believe that uh, improving the experience of using money and building automation at the smart contract level allows us to create completely new experiences, right? And uh, rather than kind of layering crypto payments on top of existing fintech solutions, we think using Web3 natively, we can provide completely new experiences and uh, kind of rather than incremental improvements go more radically and change the way your relationship with money works, right? So trying to go a bit deeper into what the future of payments could look like. Miles, do you have any response to that? So um, I think that the Lightning Network similarly off offers up opportunities to do what we call streaming Satoshis. There's a, there's a number of podcast apps that let you pay by the second or pay by the minute. I think it's a really cool concept, and I applaud you for the effort you're doing uh, with Superfluid on Ethereum. Uh, but I'm personally really excited about some of the opportunities here for moving money uh, in a different way uh, using the Lightning Network, which just opens up so many uh, new possibilities. At Cash App, we're really focused on uh, adding to the transactional utility of the Bitcoin network. And so that's internally within our, our app and our ecosystem of many tens of millions of customers. We allow for peer-to-peer -peer payments between our network. Um, and this year, we've focused on Lightning quite a bit. Uh, we've just, we're rolling out Lightning receives this week um, and increasing the transactional utility uh, by making it more accessible is something we're really focused on. We're killing the paradigm of having a toggle at the top. What, do I want an on-chain QR code? Do I want a Lightning QR code? Uh, people just want to move their Bitcoin. They don't care 
what, uh, what network it's going on. And so we've combined those QR codes uh, in an open standard called BIP21. And we believe that this will help users across the world, whether it's Beirut, El Zante, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, people just want to be able to make payments simply and easily. And having one unified QR code, I think, is going to go a long way and push the industry forward. Yeah, I mean, with respect to the Lightning Network, um, it, I, I have a question later on that I wanted to ask about mass adoption. But you, you know, it, it asks a lot, right? Like, you, you use Bitcoin, not the dollar. We're going to open channels. Like, it's it's a it's a pretty you have to bridge a couple different things in order to get a lot of people on board. It's in keeping with the libertarian like Bitcoin mindset in a sense. Like, we're going to replace the system. Does that get in the way of mass adoption, or do you really think that the Lightning Network is uh, the most powerful payment rail to like replace what's already been? Uh, and if, oh, OK, we'll come back to you in a second <laughs> as you shake your head. But. I, I do think that right now, Bitcoin is uh, definitely the leader in terms of global adoption, in terms of brand recognition, of decentralization, and resiliency. And, but it was lacking that peer-to-peer that -peer cash like, like nature that you were talking about. In 2017, um, the fees were through the roof. The, the, ti the timing to get your uh, transaction confirmed was driving people crazy and driving them to other chains. The Lightning Network is a proposed solution to that, and we're seeing really great adoption around the world. And um, that, that's why we're really focused on that uh, cash app at this time. But Francesco, why are you shaking your head? Uh, where to start? Um, <laughs> I'd say, first of all, the leader in global recognition, branding, and adoption is absolutely not Bitcoin. It's the US dollar. And I think that's kind of undisputed. Uh, but apart from that, when you talk about global adoption of the Lightning Network, realistically, any significant number of users using the Lightning Network is using it through a custodial provider. So it's not really peer-to-peer. -peer. It's, it's just not, right? Like if you're using Cash App and you use the Lightning Network through Cash App, it's not peer-to-peer. -peer. You're using a custodian. And at that point, is that really better than using PayPal with US dollars, where everybody actually wants to use US dollars, and you know, it's a more established and more understood means of payment? I mean, there's some advantages. I'm not, you know, I'm, not, I, I'm a Bitcoiner as well. I'm just saying, believing that is going to be the harbinger of mass adoption, in my opinion, is misguided. Uh, I think in the Ethereum space, there's actually a lot more promising ways of making payments. And longer term, I just don't think fighting that hard to bring uh, custodian solutions is worth fighting for. And I do think that I, it's the right moment to shift into stable coins because uh, like my overarching question here, are stable coins the reason that we can seriously talk about crypto payments now? Because when, we, when you think about it, like the benefits of a functioning payment system are the assumption or the understanding that your currency is worth tomorrow what it's worth today. And so, you know, uh, denominating uh, the cup, like the price of a cup of coffee in ETH is not going to work. Like you've got an inherently stable price, you know, put up against an inherently volatile uh, crypto asset. So enter stable coins, where you've got the ability to denominate units, units of currency that's something in, in something that's more familiar for the customer. So I put that question that I started with: Are stable coins the reason that we are talking about crypto payments in a much more serious way today? Uh, is that what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can take this. And, um I think they are a necessary condition. I think uh, it's very difficult to have fluctuating assets at the same time using them for, for a value exchange. Uh, I think they are a necessary condition. I don't think they are sufficient. I think there is many things. I don't think payments work very well in crypto today. And there is, like, people want low cost. They want speed. They want uh, high authorization rate. They want high conversion rate. In all these metrics, we are not there yet as, a, as an industry. We're not competitive with Visa Network or with uh, existing solutions. Um, I think there is a lot of promise. That we have sort of infinite runway. We can get there. Um, but there, there is a lot of work to do um, to make it usable by sort of the, to achieve mass adoption. You want to solve these things. You want to focus on the, the consumer user experience. Um, the rails should disappear. Like nobody wants to pay for stuff. People want the stuff. They don't want to pay. Uh, and so the payment mechanism should sort of fade in the background and should just work. Um, 
I think I'm very optimistic we will get there, um, but there is a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, Larry, um, you and I just a minute ago were talking about regulation and how, why don't you walk me through like PayPal's thinking with respect to stable coins, how it fits into the existing like financial regulatory framework here in the US, why that might make your life easier with respect to business. Yeah, um, I would say that it's absolutely a farce that there's no regulation in the crypto space. Um, for example, PayPal, we have a bit license, um, so we're heavily regulated by the New York Department of Financial Services. Um, I would probably say that there's definitely room for improvement at the federal level. Um, and just given there's a bit of, of confusion and still trying to figure out, you know, roles and responsibilities, um, you know, what methodologies from the previous system can be applied to the current system, that's where, uh, once that's solved, I believe a lot of uh, this adoption problem will start to be, you know, actually uh, solved. Now, with regards to um, why we're you know, excited about stable coins, and if you can think about it, to your point, payments are kind of broken right now. Um, if you can have a uh, issuer that is regulated with the cash and cash equivalent backed stable coin, you have near instant settlement, depending on what chain of stable coin it is built on. Again, you can now have that additional uh, risk and compliance um, you know, strategy with regards to chain monitoring, the, the onboarding, the continuous monitoring of transactions, et cetera. Not being big brother, but just having a, a better understanding. That way you can be a, a good citizen. Um, and then you can lower that cost. So to me, once we actually have that uh, guidance at the federal level, I think the adoption will start to come because institutions um, and investors and things of that nature will, will feel more comfortable with, with the space. Um, I have a follow-up question for you. So you buy and hold your base layer tokens, right? But when you talk about DAI and USDC, they're stable. And so is PayPal going to support USDC and DAI? Like, is it a threat to your existing business? Like, how do you make money uh, in a world where DAI and USDC are ubiquitous? Well, I won't, I won't comment on DAI or, or USDC. Um, but what oh, I, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I will say is that, again, uh, what PayPal does is, is, is payments. And we want to have seamless or near seamless um, you know, uh, offering for our customers to make it easy. So from a stablecoin perspective, we do see value. Um, again, I won't comment on, on those specifically. Um, but it is definitely something that we feel could be uh, you know, beneficial to our two-sided network, i.e. our consumers and merchants. Miles, will you weigh in on the first question that I went to everybody with? Like, are stablecoins the reason that we're more seriously talking about crypto payments today? So I see great um, interest around the world for stablecoins, oftentimes even greater than Bitcoin or Ethereum or other crypto assets. Uh, if you go down to Buenos Aires, you see people demanding to store their money in a better fiat in the, glo the current global reserve currency of today. You go to Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I, talking to some exchanges there, you see that their, their volumes have gone from 80% Bitcoin to 80% stablecoins in the last few years because these stablecoins are serving real needs for these people of capital controls, of inflating currency, uh, local currencies, and smoothing out the volatility of these cyclical three, four-year cycle, cycles that Bitcoin and Ethereum go to. And so... Cash App's mission is economic empowerment, and I see stablecoins like, providing that around the world in a really scalable manner. And so in that way, I, I do think the missions are really, really aligned. I think that what, uh, the global reserve currency of today, the US dollar in a tokenized form, alongside what I believe will be the global reserve currency of tomorrow, Bitcoin, I think that's a really, really potent combination for economic empowerment for a, a billion people around the world. And hey, Mac, just to kind of touch on that one as well, um, you know, I, I, my fiance and I were trying to send um, 1,900 rand to South Africa to the photographer for our honeymoon. Um, that's about $120. Went into my bank, wanted to send a wire. The cost of the wire was $50. So in order to send an entrepreneur in South Africa uh, 120 US dollars, it would have cost me $50 to send it. Just think about that. Now, if we could have sent that in the stablecoin version, we have this cross-border payment that is cheaper, that is faster, that the settlement is there. It's not, you know, three to seven days. I mean, that in itself is a great value proposition um, and, and just real, real utility. So I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, and I definitely want to talk more about cross-border payments in a second. Do you have any final word on stablecoins you want to weigh in? Um, no, I was going to mention, actually, I'm going to mention something about cross-border as well. Yeah, let's get into yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, kick us off. Well, 
uh, for example, even today with Superfluid, there's people using it for payroll, right? And uh, I have a couple of examples of people who have very distributed teams, right? We're talking very small team, 20 people, every single one of them in a different country, right? Now, if you imagine as a small organization having to manage that in the fiat world, that's a significant headache, right? Using Superfluid and using USDC and using, you know, effectively Polygon or other open blockchains, it's one transaction on the blockchain, which kicks off uh, 20 streams to 20 different countries, 20 different people that you never have to touch again. Like the ability to use the, these open blockchains to scale payouts in this way, I think is a very underappreciated opportunity in crypto. Obviously, you know, we focused a lot on trading, leverage, you know, these kinds of more speculative use cases. But now going into a bear market, we're seeing a lot more teams starting to appreciate that actually the infrastructure we've built is extremely useful to make cross-border uh, payments, organizations, and overall, uh, you know, the future of work way more scalable than it, it has really ever been before. Right. How, how do we think the El Salvador uh, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender experiment is working out? Obviously, El Chivo wallet, it was uh, billed as this ability to kind of, you know, cut out the intermediaries like a Western Union or a MoneyGram uh, with essentially instantaneous and uh, free cross-border transactions. Miles, how do you think that experiment is playing out? So in the run-up to the passing of the Bitcoin law, I actually spent six months in El Salvador, uh, in El Zante with the Bitcoin Beach community. I think what was really eye-opening to me was that 70% of the country is unbanked. 20% of inbound remittances, or sorry, 20% of El Salvador's GDP is inbound remittances um, from the United States. And so people, the people in El Zante, the locals there, they didn't have much of a concept of, of saving. They didn't have something that, a way to digitally hold their, 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 their money and, and transact amongst each other. It was all cash. And that cash that you earned that week, you typically spent it because there wasn't much ability to like dream, dream of growing it through investment or savings or, um, or growing into like a better life. What was really interesting was seeing the way that the idea that your Bitcoin that you held could go up in value the same amount, the same percentage as Michael Saylor's uh, Bitcoin. Um, it, it made people change their time preference of money and start thinking about the future a little bit differently. Obviously, being connected globally to have peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments with anybody else on this open network, obviously, that kind of showed the connectivity and ability to, to interact um, with the, the, the broader world in a global way. So with Chivo and the 90-day the rollout, no, I think there were a lot of problems. Um, I think that was rushed. I think that... Um, you, shouldn't you shouldn't mandate the acceptance of a specific currency. So I think it's been a mixed bag. I think that the media perception is, is worse than what's going on down there because I, was, I saw and experienced lives being changed by having access to a new emerging monetary standard. Yeah, I, when, when I th I'm going I'm to shift course in terms of like adoption of crypto payments in the U.S. The IRS certainly isn't making it easy at this point, and there is an absence of hard and fast rules on Capitol Hill uh, right now. And so, Larry, you, you, I know you wanted to weigh in more on regulation, and my, my question is, can we have mass adoption when it is unclear what kind of tax bill you're facing? And every we don't have a de minimis exception right now. I know there are talks of that happening, but. Can you really, you know, appreciably progress on this front without more clarity from uh, regulators? I mean, in my view, um, it's going to be a, a slow drip because at the end of the day, trust uh, and understanding of the rules of the road, it's extremely important, not only to build out the infrastructure, to have the investment, but to have the participants. So, you know, honestly, I, I believe that without clear regulatory clarity, um, that way uh, teams can build out uh, the policies and procedures that are required, um, the risk, identify the risk and, and develop the control ecosystem. Um, I, I don't think we're going to get that, that explosion that we all are kind of hoping for and, and think that can happen. I, I agree. And uh, I think the de minimis is uh, 
the exclusion is kind of like step one to really get the transactional utility of cryptocurrency going. I think the US could look to what's go how, what they're doing in Portugal, what they're also doing in El Salvador, where there's no capital gains um, when using these currencies. And I think that will really provide the incentives and really get rid of so much of the complexity involved uh, in spending this and hopefully allowing uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to achieve that dream of peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. Uh, I take the other side of this argument. I'd actually argue that the law isn't going to bring, like, law change, laws changing don't bring in new behaviors. New behaviors bring in changes in the law. So, you know, mass adoption of uh, marijuana didn't wait for legalization. And I don't think that's going to happen for Bitcoin either, right? I mean, if people want to use Bitcoin, they'll use it, and eventually the IRS will have to adapt to that. It's not going to be the other way, ar ar uh, the other way around. I think that's. Uh, kind of overly optimistic. Uh, people do what they want to do, and then you know the government has to adapt to that. It's never the other way around, in my opinion. But just kind of to counter that, I would say marijuana and, and you know, transferring value are, are a little bit different, because everyone needs to transfer value. Um, and at the end of the day, um, it is extremely challenging to envision a world of mass adoption when, to your point, I don't know what my taxes are going to be. I don't know if it could be freezed, my, my assets could be freezed and seized. Um, how do I have any insurance? Those are like key questions that go to this component of trust. Just being in, in this payment space, um, it's extremely important um, to be able to demonstrate trust to consumers. Um, that's one of the reasons why PayPal, I believe, has been so successful is because your buyer and seller protections and things of, like, of that nature. So um, I hear where you're coming from, but I really think th those rules of the road are, are more important than we realize. If, if you think about like, what is the component piece of, uh, of the economy, it's, it's payments, whether person to person, person to business, or business to business. The, the total GDP, the total sum of the economy is really made up of these base layer component pieces. And if we're going to build and kickstart um, a new monetary system to, in, into existence and into its prevalence, we need to be able to make these transactions across all three layers. I think oftentimes we talk about uh, payments in the, the customer to merchant use case, but really, really we need to be unlocking um, and, and mainstreaming all sorts of adoption across all three types of transactions, in my opinion. So we have representatives from some of the biggest payment platforms on the stage right now. I've got three minutes left. Can each of you give us a preview of how the payment landscape for at your respective companies is going to look different in six months from now? Like, What do we not know is cooking at your respective uh, stations? Uh, kick us off. What's, what's going to be different? <laughs> what's going to be different? Well, we've uh, just launched a significant partnership with a company called CoinShift. They're one of the biggest payroll companies in Web3. And we're basically rolling out now a payroll solution for uh, hundreds of uh, crypto native organizations. We're going to enable this for money streaming. All these people are going to start getting paid every second that they work. And uh, I believe this is going to significantly change the way uh, people in crypto native organizations start relating to money. Um, I'm very excited to you know, build more of this uh, ecosystem. And yeah, check out our website. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we've just expanded payouts to, to many, many more countries. We've talked about this yesterday in, in the press. Um, I'm excited about these kind of use cases. I think we can do more on the accepting payment side. And so what I think we can look forward to is um, the same way that like, people forget this, but 10 years ago, processing payments on the internet was incredibly difficult. And Stripe was created to solve this. Um, I think we are entering a new phase where Stripe can really help with the crypto payment acceptance, with any sort of form, form of payment, by focusing on the, the consumer UX. Like, this is where the difficulty is at the moment. Um, and so I think we can look forward to better ways to process payments on the, uh, using crypto. And Larry, we'll say this. like The last two years, PayPal has been buying uh, crypto native companies, Curve among them. We've seen some new crypto product launches, but I have to imagine that this is going to culminate in something else. So <laughs> give us a preview. Yeah, um, obviously, without being able to say anything, <laughs> um, currently, you know, we have buy, wholesale, transfer, as in June, and checkout. Um, I can say that it's an important initiative of the firm that we have a very engaged and bright team and we're working on some, some great products. So we're really excited about the next six months. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, at Cash App, we're going to continue to drive Bitcoin into the mainstream with our growing customer base. Across Block Inc., there's a number of really exciting um, Bitcoin and crypto-based initiatives that are in various, various phases of uh, nascency. But just like uh, Spiral, our open source division uh, within Block, kind of incubated for about two years before Cash App was able to use what, the, what, they call, uh, what they've called the Lightning Developer Kit to stand up our first, um, the, to stand up the Lightning Network at a first, that the first public company to ever do that. Um, we're we're going to stay close to the other business units that are driving innovation across the company, and hopefully uh, produce some really great stuff for the world. Uh, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>